Good afternoon. Welcome to FTA's listening session. To get us started, we will turn to FTA Administrator Maria Fernandez. Hello everyone, I'm Nuria Fernandez, and I wanna thank all of you for joining us for the very first listening session of FTA's Transit Renewal Initiative. I hope you're doing well and you're keeping safe. I really appreciate you tuning in for what I'm sure will be a lively and informative conversation about best practices to help reinforce that America's open and transit's open. At this session, FTA will engage transit leaders organizational partners, and everyone who cares about the future of public transportation. We hope you will join us in promoting the incredible resource we have in our national transit system. Transit opens doors to jobs, schools, essential services, and above all, opportunity. At FTA, we want to ensure we're doing our very best to convey this simple message. The Biden-Harris administration has shown unprecedented support for transit making truly transformative investments through the American Rescue Plan. And this week, the president and a group of senators announced a once in a generation investment in our infrastructure, which is now being considered by Congress. The deal includes 550 billion in new federal investment in Americans infrastructure. And it includes the largest investment in transit in the history of our country. The bipartisan infrastructure deal will grow the economy it's gonna enhance our competitiveness, create good jobs, and make our economy more sustainable, resilient, and just. We see a future for transit where in the president's words, we build back better. Every day, transit agencies are demonstrating they provide service that is safe, fast, frequent, and reliable. In fact, agencies across the country have worked with public health professionals to ensure that countermeasures and cleaning protocols have resulted in the safest possible transit system for employees and riders alike. And with the recent change in CDC recommendations, the way some Americans live their lives could change as masks may return to common usage. However, transit remains safe because our mask mandate has remained in place throughout. Because of your efforts, I am confident that working together, we can continue to deliver the very best transit service possible at this very pivotal time for our industry. At today's listening session, we will ask panelists to highlight best practices and how they're increasing ridership across the industry. And we hope to encourage other transit systems to consider these and other strategies and continue to share their stories with us. This isn't the only opportunity you have to contribute. Please send your experiences, your thoughts, questions, and ways we can continue to support you to transits open at dot.gov. To get us started, I will introduce two of FTA's regional administrators who, in addition to overseeing millions of dollars in federal funding, they interact with dozens of transit agencies every week. Later, we will turn to FTA's Associate Administrator for Communications and Congressional Affairs, Paul Kincaid, to introduce our panelists and help facilitate our Q&A session. But first, Yvette Taylor is FTA's Region 4 Administrator in Atlanta. Dr. Taylor has led Region 4 since 2005, so she brings a deep well of experience to her position. And Ray Tellis has led FTA's Region 9 in the San Francisco area since 2019, bringing his 25 years of experience in the industry, including most recently directing FTA's LA office. So now let me turn it over to you, Yvette and Ray. Thank you, Nuria, and thank you, everyone. I'm Yvette Taylor, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you from FTA's Region 4 in Atlanta, Georgia. We all know that transit ridership on the upswing in 2019 took a hit in the most challenging months of the pandemic. Now, as we emerge, we are adapting and putting transit's best foot forward to encourage riders to get on board. Certainly in my region, we are seeing better news regarding transit ridership. In a moment, we will hear from Jimmy Morales, 
who serves as Acting Director of Transportation and Public Works in Miami-Dade County. We invited Jimmy to talk about what his team is doing in South Florida to remind folks that transit is open and that people all over are riding Miami-Dade system, heavy rail, light rail, and buses to get where they need to go. Last year, with the pandemic, during the worst of the pandemic, Miami-Dade County continued to see improvement in their ridership. They undertook a comprehensive system design review. And as a result, riders are experiencing much shorter wait times for buses on many routes. More buses equal more riders getting where they need to go faster. We all know getting where you're going quickly is a great way to encourage people to get on board. I am sure many agencies are undertaking similar strategic reviews of their systems and how they can adjust and adapt to new ridership patterns we are seeing. But before we learn more about this, let me hand this off to my colleague, Ray Tellis. Thank you. Thank you, Yvette. And it is good to be here with all of you. I'm Ray Tellis. I'm the FTA Region 9 Administrator, and I'm joining you from San Francisco. One of the hallmarks of FTA's Transit Renewal Initiative is to tell everyone, frequent riders, occasional riders, and those who are not yet riders, that transit is clean, safe, reliable, and typically the most affordable way to get around. I can tell you that in Los Angeles, it is the fastest way to go almost anywhere. So transit is a major part of California's efforts to tackle the climate crisis, which has become more and more acute this summer. California imposed a requirement for all transit bus fleets to go to an electric system, even before President Biden announced his greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. We would like Californians and everyone actually to connect those important dots and get on board to reduce emissions to give our kids a shot at healthier lives and a safer planet. So we will hear shortly from Sharon Cooney. Uh, Sharon is the CEO of the San Diego Metropolitan Transit System, the MTS. Among other efforts, MTS has encouraged ridership through a partnership with local businesses. Their program prompts people to take transit by offering a free monthly transit pass corresponding to their visit to businesses in San Diego County. So the MTS rolled out the initiative with great pictures of local businesses and a video. And seeing them reminds me of all the places I would want to visit the next time I'm in San Diego. The, in the initiative is just one of the creative ideas we are seeing as we seek to tell everyone that America is open and transit is open. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first panelist. Uh, we will start this afternoon's discussion with Paul Scatellis. He's the president and chief executive officer of the American Public Transportation Association. And Scott Bogren is the Community Transportation Association of America's executive director. We would like each one of them to discuss what they have seen and heard from their members that represent some of the best strategies to increase ridership. Paul has spent his entire career working in or advocating for public transportation. He joined APTA in 2018, and it is my privilege to welcome my good friend, Paul. The floor is all yours. Well, thank you, Ray, very much. Greetings, everyone. And Thank you to FTA Administrator Nuria Fernandez for inviting me to join this timely conversation. Uh, this new renewal initiative gets to the heart of conversations that we at APTA have been having with our members over the past several months regarding the return of ridership and post-pandemic planning and approaches for the industry. I first want to mention a tool that we recently developed that I'm very proud of, the APTA Ridership Dashboard. We have partnered with Transit App to build a new resource for the entire transit industry. It tracks demand for public transit and estimates ridership in near real time. According to the dashboard, current ridership nationally 
is at 54% of what it was for the same week in 2019 pre-pandemic. While some smaller systems are reporting some very favorable ridership numbers approaching 80% of pre-pandemic levels. The dashboard also allows agencies, stakeholders, local advocates, and others to compare ridership between systems, between their system and their regions, and across the nation. It's vitally important that our industry see this information in near real time so that we can react to changes in needs and understand trends that are evolving quickly. In talking to our members, most agencies envision a phased approach to the return of riders, expecting a bump this fall, starting in September, as offices begin to reopen, and then irregular growth with changes in service levels and networks that respond to demand. Agencies are engaging with community business leaders and educational institutions to understand their return to in-person plans in order to be ready for returning riders and changing community patterns. Many employers expect telecommunicating to remain, particularly on Mondays and Fridays, but systems are not yet considering Monday and Friday service level changes. Agencies are planning to better coordinate and increase service to and from educational institutions to focus on students as they return to earn in-person classes. It's important that elected officials and stakeholder groups understand that ridership recovery will be a slow process. Next slide, please. Returning to pre-pandemic service and ridership levels is not like flipping a light switch. It will take time to get restarted and to implement changes. Ridership patterns will change and routes will undoubtedly need to be adjusted. This is an important time for considering redesign of routes, both to meet the changing demand for service and to address longstanding equity issues. Let me give you just a few examples of current service enhancements that are happening. In Washington, DC, WMATA and DC government have continued to build out curb access for bicycles and for transit and businesses throughout this pandemic period. In San Francisco, San Francisco Muni has installed temporary transit lanes on key routes to speed up service so that transit riders do not bear the cost of traffic congestion. In Salt Lake City, the UTA is joining forces with community partners to offer late night on-demand rides for late night workers, shift workers, and those attending events. And in Milwaukee, their all electric BRT line is designed to reduce emissions, address racial disparities, and be simultaneously built with a new high-rise development that will feature a key transit station. Next slide. We're also seeing discussion and re-examination of fare policies and systems all around the country. Public transportation services in Tucson, Arizona will continue to be free through the end of the year using federal funds to cover the loss in revenue. In Los Angeles, LA Metro is implementing a fare-free option for students beginning with a pilot this fall, which is expected to expand from there. And finally, we see agencies developing a common campaign theme of letting riders know that transit will be ready when they're ready to return. As part of its efforts to welcome back riders, Chicago Transit Authority's Refresh and Renew initiative will accelerate the agency's existing rail station revitalization program. CTA has also launched a public service campaign called, When You're Ready, We Are Ready. To encourage those re-entering the workforce to use transit in Las Vegas, the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada, its campaign of Try Transit is working with businesses to offer complimentary seven-day passes. These are just a few examples of what the industry is doing as we ramp up for the return of ridership in this new normal period. I wanna thank you again uh, to all of you tuning in, but certainly to FTA for bringing us together at this important time to discuss this topic. I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you. And thank you, Paul, for sharing those great examples. My name is Paul Kincaid. I'm proud to be back at FTA as part of the Biden-Harris administration working with our amazing communications and congressional affairs team. I wanna thank APTA and all of our friends here for letting us take advantage of the wealth of information that you collect from your members to help us renew transit. My role today is to guide us through the rest of our panels and to run a question and answering session. 
Also joining us today into the session will be Dr. Nikki Cohen from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, mainly in a listening role. Thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. We appreciate you joining us. I know everybody in the transit agency appreciates the work that you've done. First, to continue our panel discussion, I'll turn it over to Scott Bogren, Executive Director of CTAA. Scott has worked for the organization in a variety of roles before being selected to lead CTAA in 2016. We're very pleased you could join us today, Scott. Thanks, Paul. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and I'm honored today to kind of be here representing rural, tribal, small cities, non-emergency medical providers, specialized and paratransit operators. And I'd also like to thank Nuria and the entire team at the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, we need to be engaged in this critical discussion right now. And we really need as an industry to be intentional about how we're gonna win back transit ridership and not passive. Uh, I often like to say with my, my, my folks and my staff, you know, hope is not a plan. And I'd also just like to stress uh, and remind everyone that um, our entrance nationally and certainly from a transit industry perspective into the pandemic, we've heard this word unprecedented used uh, over and over again. And the entrance into these issues was unprecedented as will be the exit strategy that we're all hoping we are starting to see now. Um, uh, this next slide gives a sense of who our members are. And I wanted to, to say that I, I per personally discussed these kinds of issues with 25 of our members in the last couple of days to make sure that I was providing kind of the best information I could, could provide here to this group. And I wanted to thank uh, my members for being so accommodating and giving and providing so much good data and examples. Uh, next slide. So what are the common elements that we're hearing from our membership on winning back ridership? Well, the first and foremost is effective customer communications. Uh, Two-way dialogue, trying to understand what riders need and communicating what you as members, as operators are doing. Uh, this is critical right now. And all these other uh, key facets that I, I have here as bullet points, none of them work without effective communications. The service flexibility, I think, is another interesting uh, dynamic that we're seeing emerge as we move through the pandemic. Um, many CTA members are fixed route operators, and the ones I've been speaking to, uh, I, I, would, I would concur with Paul. Uh, smaller agencies, our ridership is returning. Um, CTA's fixed route members report anywhere from around 50 to upwards of 90 percent of ridership returning. Um, but many of them um, gave me a, a, a phrase that I wanted to share, particularly in the fixed route side, and that is going to be an emphasis on quality instead of quantity of trips and an emphasis on value over volume. I think that's gonna be really important as we move forward. We've learned a lot about essential operations and what that really means. We've learned a lot about our role in equity. And I think that in the fixed route side, we're going to have to really emphasize those issues. In the on-demand side, the paratransit side, dial-a-ride, many, many CTA members operate in this mode. We're hearing many of our members are back at 100%. And that flexibility there, I think, tells, tells us a lot. A lot of CTA's members, too, um, are operating in university communities. They're operating and they serve a lot of older adults. Uh, people with disabilities, and, and it depends on how fast those campuses open and students return, uh, medical trips start to happen again, senior centers open. So a lot of that is part of kind of this flexibility that we think buses and, and vehicles that can be moved are going to be critical. Understanding emerging travel patterns and shifts uh, flexibility, listening to where customers are going to want to be going, understanding changes in commuting patterns. Paul mentioned Monday and Friday. I think we're going to have a lot of issues there that, that are going to be incumbent upon us as leaders in the field to understand and move, and move towards safety. Safety used to be training drivers, keeping the vehicles well maintained. Safety now includes cleaning. It now includes airflow, it in, and it includes information for our customers about what we're doing. We've got to be careful here, though, to communicate what we've done over the last year and a half 
in ways that our customers understand and can value. Uh, in incidental services, the FTA has been a great partner to a lot of transit systems allowing for incidental uses of vehicles. Grocery and meal delivery, prescription delivery, uh, buses being used as mobile vaccination clinics. That's a key as well to showing our value, as I said earlier, and winning back ridership. And I would be remiss if I didn't raise the issue of the scarcity of drivers and operators right now. Every member I talked to said the thing that worried them most about getting their ridership back and winning back their ridership was having enough drivers and operators to get their full fleet of vehicles out there serving folks. Next slide. Some examples of the things that we've seen, and I'll, I'll kind of move as you're looking at it from left to right. Our member at Rogue Valley Transit in Medford, Oregon, uh, similar to what Paul was mentioning with Chicago, when you're ready, we're ready a campaign that's designed around getting people back on the bus. I was particularly interested, they're gonna be doing free transit Tuesdays to allow people to get back on the vehicles and kind of see and experience what safety protocols, how they look and feel. In the middle, our member in Iowa, Herta, does great work with social media and is emphasizing again, the safety. Herta's won back almost 70% of its ridership and it's because they are able to communicate these. Last to the right, our member of the Potomac Valley Transit Authority moving a lot of its trips to on-demand and a ready ride program where their ridership has exceeded pre-COVID-19 levels. Flexibility, learning where people wanna go and making sure our service can meet that. That's the key to our future. Paul, I'll turn it back to you and thanks again for the opportunity to speak on behalf of CTA and its members. Thank you very much, Scott. Those small agency examples are great. We love to see them. I'd like to welcome Roger Millar now, Washington State Secretary of Transportation, as well as Ashto's Chair for its Council on Public Transportation. Roger? Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I want to thank FDA Administrator Fernandez and her team at the FTA for starting this uh, national conversation to help transit agencies renew, rebuild, and enhance their ridership and for hosting this first of three listening sessions. Um, as you heard, my name is Roger Millar. I'm the secretary of the Washington State DOT. Among other things, WashDOT manages the Washington State ferry system, the largest, the largest ferry system in the country and the third largest transit system in the state of Washington. I also serve as a member of the board of directors of Sound Transit. And I'm happy to uh, represent AASHTO today on this panel as chair of the Council on Public Transportation. And, it's really a privilege to be a part of this group of distinguished leaders in the transportation space. So next slide, please. So Washington State, we're rethinking transit. Spurred by the pandemic, we led a series of workshops with a diverse group of transportation partners to create a shared vision of, for how transit and mobility will adapt and evolve in this post-COVID environment. So several next steps emerged from those workshops that'll help us develop an action plan for rethinking transit as we navigate our post-pandemic future. We've learned that, and we've known this all along, but the COVID uh, emphasized that we must prioritize human services and equity. People with special transportation needs and traditionally underserved communities are in dire need of improved mobility options, many of which have been severely constrained by the pandemic. <clears throat> we must invest in infrastructure to support transit and mobility. Transit-friendly infrastructure helps ensure that transit providers can offer fast and reliable services for their riders. Next slide, please. So why are people returning to transit? You know, as we know, pandemic, the pandemic wreaked havoc on transit systems across the country. In Washington state, our transit ridership dropped by about 45% around the state. While it's important to get people to return to transit, we can't forget those who never left transit like people who do not own cars or cannot afford a car, people who use non-emergency medical transport and are in need of in-person medical assistance like dialysis and our essential workforce, the nurses, the healthcare professionals, the public safety, transportation providers, first responders. These people never left the system. You know, frankly, it was the white collar workers and people who could work from home who stopped riding the bus. With all of the health and disinfecting precautions implemented by transit agencies, <clears throat> people should know that transit is safe. We need to continue getting that message out. Uh, they also need to be reminded that it's better for the environment than driving alone. Next slide, please. 
I do want to talk about the importance of transit to rural communities. It's absolutely essential. Living in a rural area without a personal vehicle is difficult, to say the least. Uh, the closest centrally located services, such as medical facilities and grocery stores, can be five to 50 miles away. And increased ridership in rural areas isn't the end all be all. It's not the metric. Access is. Ensuring and improving access to medical appointments, grocery stores, job sites, and more is a priority for WatchDot, not just ridership numbers. Lastly, we cannot forget that transit provides a lifeline for small urban communities and people with special needs, like people with disabilities, seniors, and veterans. Next slide, please. So, Across the state, when the pandemic hit, rural and urban providers had to act fast and nimbly. They relied on partnerships with other agencies in their communities. In some cases, they forged new ones, but adapt they did. And while examples of the superb work are too hard to count, here are three. Uh, Whatcom Transit Authority pivoted quickly into food bank deliveries to paratransit riders and worked with local hospitals to deliver meals to residents at senior living communities and they wasted no time getting the word out about the services that they were providing. Pierce Transit um, in the Central Puget Sound began offering free Wi-Fi to students with limited internet, internet access in both rural and urban parts of their service area by staging buses at central locations as Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, many of our agencies decided to go fare free to provide even greater access to their service during these times. And one of our systems, Columbia County Public Transportation, found the increased access to be so much of an asset that they're going fare free indefinitely. Um, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you, Paul. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, Roger. Those are great examples. And on behalf of the Biden-Harris administration, we'd also like to thank all the transit agencies across the country who took Americans to their vaccination appointments that'll help protect our nation. Now we'll turn it to Tom Curtin, Infrastructure Program Director for the National Governors Association. Tom? Thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Tom Curtin, a program director for infrastructure at the National Governors Association in our Center for Best Practices. And I'm happy to be here today representing NGA to talk about returning ridership to our nation's transit systems. And I'm glad to join this distinguished panel. I really want to thank FTA for having this important conversation. The National Governors Association represents, uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, the National Governors Association represents the nation's uh, 55 governors of our states and territories. Uh, and what we're looking at right now is, is a photo of uh, the original meeting of NGA back in 1908, uh, which was called by President Roosevelt to actually tackle transportation issues uh, in the states. So we have a uh, rich history in engaging on transportation issues uh, here at NGA. Uh, and I actually joined NGA back in November, but prior to that, I had the honor of serving as Chief of Staff at the Maryland Department of Transportation, uh, which is one of the few state agencies that operates a large transit system. So be able to share some insights from that time as well as we work through COVID. The members we represent at NGA have been committed to supporting the transit industry as transit agencies across the nation have served as essential lifelines during the COVID-19 pandemic. And like many of you, uh, we have an eye towards uh, the day where we see our communities returning to work, school, and play on transit. And I think we've all seen how transit can be a major economic driver in our states and was critical to supporting not only our health care, but broader workforce and businesses throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. As we recover, and as we've just heard from our friends at APTA, AASHTO, and CTAA, transit will be there. And we can't, you know, can't echo that message enough. Transit will be there to take people to work and school to help the economy recover and play a key role in helping our communities thrive. Our nation's multimodal transportation system supports and enhances economic growth of the states and well-designed communities can help sustain quality of life, promote access to opportunity and enable the flow of interstate commerce. NGA is committed to helping governors achieve all their policy goals from workforce development to enhancing public health to environmental and energy goals. And our partners in the transit community are important stakeholders in these policy discussions. And the services they provide are complementary and even critical to achieving these policy objectives. Now, while not many states operate transit systems themselves, they provide critical support, financial and otherwise, to transit authorities and local networks in their jurisdictions. Some of the things we see broadly uh, are the utilization of dedicated grant funding, technical assistance, leveraging procurement efficiencies for local transit authorities and uh, administrations to supporting transit agencies nationwide. 
uh, and our agencies, uh, as we've seen, uh, and I've seen, some, you know, we've seen some great examples here today, are looking at tailoring their service to uh, the most effective use and provide services to the riders where they need the most. Uh, in Maryland, uh, as we were working through COVID, we worked with Baltimore uh, area employers uh, in the public health and other critical sectors to make sure that we continued to get people to work and to uh, healthcare and to the places that they needed to be to serve those critical uh, positions and critical services. And it's more than these just community conversations. Uh, you know, agencies are finding that they can be proactive in using technology and data to drive decisions and improve service. Uh, things that we were doing before, like transit signal prioritization to make service more reliable, which ultimately reliable service is a key factor in attracting those choice riders back to the network. And agencies are also using new mediums of communication and technology to reach customers about the benefit of transit. And I think we've seen some of those examples here today. You know, making it easier to buy tickets online, making those fare products more flexible and accessible to meet riders as they return to work in a post-COVID world. And cost is also a factor. Uh, you know, we've seen some agencies and saw some examples here today look at piloting reduced or even free fares. Uh, just recently in Maryland, Governor Hogan used some uh, ARPA uh, relief funds to offset the cost of a legislatively mandated fare increase that was slated to uh, take place just a few weeks ago. So that'll provide some relief to customers. And governors are excited about the opportunities to innovate in the transportation and infrastructure space from autonomous and other vehicles that offer last mile solutions to alternative fuel vehicles and the transit systems of tomorrow. We see a great opportunity to modernize, partner and innovate in the transportation in the public transportation space. So like I said, NGA is very happy to lend our voice alongside our partner agencies in the FTA on this initiative and get people to return to transit. The success of these transit systems will depend on these partnerships. And we wanna hear from you and the traveling public on what they wanna see in their transit systems today, tomorrow and going forward. And we look forward to working with each and every one of you in the states and territories to renew uh, ridership and transit. Thank you. And thank you, Tom, a lot of food for thought for us. And we appreciate you highlighting those examples, things we can all definitely learn from. Next, we want to move to our panel of transit agency leaders. Our speakers lead transit agencies that have recorded impressive ridership numbers over the last few months. Hopefully, we'll be able to learn from what has created their success. We'll start out with Jimmy Morales, Acting Director of Transportation and Public Works in Miami-Dade County. Jimmy? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jimmy Morales. I'm uh, Chief Operating Officer for Miami-Dade County and the Interim uh, Director of Transportation and Public Works. Uh, today's actually my last day, starting Monday. Uh, Ulyss Kleckley uh, from uh, formerly Denver will be joining us as our new director. And uh, so uh, this will maybe my at last act in that role, but I'm really pleased to be here to talk about some of our experiences. Um, you know, like many agencies across, or most across this country, uh, we were forced to cut service at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and probably hit it particularly hard because our hospitality industry, which is so critical to our economy, was essentially shut down um, uh, you know, as a result of the pandemic. But as Director uh, Yvette Taylor mentioned earlier, um, unlike maybe some other agencies, we moved quickly to uh, restore pre-pandemic service on most of our routes once we began to open up. And um, our, our recent numbers, as you see on the slide, um, are really encouraging. We've recovered close to 70% of our May 2019 ridership on our rail and bus systems. And even on some, some of our major quarters, we've actually seen increased ridership than we had before COVID. Now, um, I think one of the reasons that has happened, and it's always good to have a little luck on your side, I guess, is that um, before the pandemic had really even begun, Miami-Dade was already in the process of doing a comprehensive reevaluation of our bus system, our network redesign we've been calling the Better Bus Network. Um, and as you know, the focus often of that is to look at how do we reach the most people in this urban area, not necessarily the widest geographic cover so that we can really increase ridership and get the most people to their jobs, their schools, uh, et cetera. Um, and so we've been doing that kind of work We've been doing as a result of that, also extensive outreach through public meetings, uh, first in person, then obviously during the pandemic virtually. Uh, and, and then we did community-wide surveys and, and really received a lot of input. And so because of the fact that we were far along in that process, when the pandemic hit, we were actually able to take elements of that plan um, uh, and the things we've learned to influence our approach to how we provided, particularly Metro bus service at the height of the pandemic. We saw areas that, uh, needed more frequent and faster trips. We shifted operators from lesser used express and overnight routes, uh, some of which, uh, depending on the nature of the ridership, uh, had fallen off 
quite drastically. We realigned evening and weekend bus service uh, to make sure all riders were getting where they need uh, to go. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to make up for the um, decreased overnight bus service, we introduced our Go Nightly program. You'll see some of the details on the slide. This allowed uh, riders through a third party service like an Uber or Lyft to get to and from work uh, during late night hours. This was hugely important for essential workers in Miami Dade County who rely on public transportation. And again, particularly in the hospitality industry where you have really 24 seven shifts at hotels, many restaurants, et cetera. Uh, it was important to provide that nighttime service, but the best way to do it really was through our Go Nightly program. We provided a call-in number for riders without smartphones. Additionally, the service also provided wheelchair accessible vehicles to support all of our riders. We also used real-time passenger load information to address corridors where riders were being left behind due to necessary social distancing requirements on vehicles. As you might imagine, uh, we couldn't load up every bus. We had to practice so social distancing norms, and that sometimes meant people were left at the station. Where we in those areas where we saw uh, you know, uh, larger numbers than, than reasonable, we provided additional frequency by adding 120 buses from a private contractor. We didn't have the internal capacity of uh, both the drivers or equipment uh, that we brought on last year uh, to provide that service uh, and to really significantly reduce the number of people that were uh, ever left behind on any one stop. Next slide, please. One of the things uh, that we also did, and, and you've seen it mentioned by some of the earlier speakers, is we suspended fares for over a year, uh, removing the burden of transportation fees for a ridership base hit particularly hard by the economic impacts of the pandemic. We wanted to be very sensitive to that. Fees were suspended uh, as of March of 2020 and were not restored until June 2021. Needless to say, uh, we, um, we uh, noticed that and communicated that well in advance of the reinstatement to make sure uh, that folks were well aware. Um, removing the fares also played an important role in terms of uh, operator safety, because by, by removing the fares, uh, the fare boxes, which were all located at the front door, we, uh, that allowed for rear bo uh, door boarding, set, which really reduced the um, interaction between uh, passengers and, and, and operators. And as we know, bus operators were, were one of those first line essential workers, many, uh, sadly, many of which were impacted adversely uh, by, by the pandemic. Um, communication, key. Communication with our riders has been very key. We've done that through both traditional and digital channels, ensuring up-to-date information on routes, on fares, safety guidance, like when we had to reissue our golden passport for seniors and others. Um, uh, and we've made this information available at stations, on vehicles, and across all digital platforms, including the Go Miami Dade transit mobile application and the department's social media channels. Uh, in addition, my marketing team has spent uh, most of the last 16 months promoting that Miami Day Transit is and remained and remains a safe option for travelers and has continued to educate the public on how to ride safely. As we know, masks are still a requirement on transit. Sadly, we are seeing now obviously a resurgence of a, of a potential new wave with the Delta variant. And we are taking all steps to reassure folks that we are ready for that and that transit will continue to be main safe no matter what happens uh, in that process. So we really have tried to take a holistic approach to bringing riders back on board. It's working, we believe, and we're reinforcing that America is open and transit is open. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jimmy. As a Floridian, I'm very much impressed with what Miami-Dade has been able to accomplish, particularly with the challenges of last year. Let's turn now to Sharon Cooney, who is CEO of San Diego Metropolitan Transit System. Sharon, what can you share with us about your efforts to bring riders back? Thank you, Paul, and thank you to the FTA for having me. We are certainly operating through uncharted territory in managing our operations, and I know all of us are anxious to restore our ridership to pre-pandemic levels as fast as possible. Next slide. At MTS, we had some success from which to build. Like other agencies, we had worked hard before the pandemic to reverse a several year downward trend in ridership. We developed a straightforward choose transit campaign that focused on real riders who choose transit because it made their lives better. Traditionally, transit campaigns have focused on the benefits of riding. This campaign differed slightly in that it concentrated on the lifestyles of our riders, what was important in their lives and showed how transit fit within their core values. This was largely a digital campaign that we used to op optimize our messaging. 
For two years, we culminated our campaigns with a free ride day that coincided with the state's Clean Air Week. We coordinated with all our cities in our region to promote ridership. And this was supported by a large scale outdoor campaign with billboards, vehicle wraps, and the utilization of our assets, such as shelters and benches. And I was pleased to see that it worked. We got a tremendous pump, bump in our ridership, 31% over a typical weekday. As you can see from the chart, we were well on our way to increasing our annual ridership before the pandemic hit. Next slide. With the pandemic, just like everyone else, we had to pivot quickly. As we are considered to be an essential business with the mission to get essential workers to their jobs, we developed a clean ride campaign. Again, this was largely a digital campaign, but it was also supported by an outdoor campaign to show that MTS was safe to ride and to encourage proper etiquette of wearing masks and appropriate social distancing. Key to this campaign was our operational commitment to keep service levels close to 100%. And again, we supported our efforts with a free ride day on election day and free rides to vaccination sites. And as Ray mentioned, in late 2020, we developed a campaign with small businesses to help people get out and support their local businesses. Eat, Shop, Play partnered with more than 100 establishments. People were incentivized to make purchases at these businesses. So when they got 10 stamps, they were able to redeem their card for a free monthly pass. This was supported by a dedicated website, significant advertising and support from our board of directors. It was really another great way to keep connected and relevant to our communities. And our social media team endeavors to keep connected with our riders at all times. As an example of the fun we had, the photo on the screen pays homage to Star Wars on May the 4th. Next slide. Looking forward, MTS is going to take advantage of several huge improvements to our system that will help us recover our ridership. As I mentioned, we were quick to return to close to 100% operations in June 2020 and have been addressed adding service improvements since. We're also celebrating the San Diego Light Rail Trolley's 40th anniversary with a community celebration tomorrow. And we have several events planned in the coming months to highlight our federally funded 11 mile extension to the system set to open in November. We're also launching Pronto, our new account-based fare collection system. This system provides best fare capabilities, mobile ticketing, and real-time account management. We are about to launch a very aggressive outreach effort to convert people to Pronto. So as you can see, we have plenty of opportunities to stay in front of our customers and the public at large. Next slide. Right now, we're building on this, off the success of our previous campaigns to utilize employees to welcome people back to our system. That will morph into a welcome aboard campaign featuring real riders who have come back to our system and are excited about riding transit again. But our major effort will be a free ride month in September for those who have established a Pronto account. This will give people an opportunity to try transit for the first time. We are coordinating this effort with our institutional partners to increase transit use. We are working with school districts to distribute youth cards, with universities, with hard to reach communities through partnerships with CBOs. This will be a major effort. It's also important to note that there are other factors at play as well. Upwards of 70% of our riders are transit dependents. So as businesses reopen and the tourism market returns, we're seeing riders come back. And special events will play a role as well, as we're already seeing ridership spikes when the Padres are in town. So in conclusion, we're confident that our ridership recovery efforts combined with all of the exceptional opportunities to advance transit in San Diego will lead to significant gains in ridership. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I know everyone at FTA looks forward to the light rail to USD opening later this year, and I'm sure everyone in San Diego loves taking the transit to see Slam Diego. Now I'd like to turn to Jason Fairbrush, Director of Embark Transit in Oklahoma City. Jason. Well, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, Paul, and uh, thanks to the FTA for um, hosting this, um, this session and inviting us to, to, show, to showcase kind of what's going on in Oklahoma City in terms of uh, transit and, and where our ridership is. 
So um, as most of you know, Oklahoma City is located uh, pretty much in the center of the country. We are the capital city of Oklahoma City. And uh, I'm sorry, the capital city of the state. And um, we are a very car centric uh, city probably not a surprise to a lot on the panel. Uh, but this means a couple of things to us as transit professionals within our community. Um, one is, of course, we recognize the fact that public transit is the great equalizer, right? Y giving everyone access to public transportation. And the second thing is we know uh, being in a car-centric community and, and, and what we learned through our customer service surveys is that most of our customer base are transit dependent. We know this because through these surveys, they tell us that they have either one or no vehicles within their household. So as the, as the pandemic uh, was upon us, um, you know, as a management team, you know, we, we really felt it was our duty, you know, to recognize these nuances and, and not only do everything we could do to make our systems as safe as possible, but also to let our community know what we were doing or what we continue to do. Thinking of those individuals that are using our, our system that may not have any other or very few transportation options, we wanted them to make we wanted to make sure that they knew the service they were using was safe. And so what we really focused on were the basics. And that was what a lot of transit agencies did, really reinventing the way we took care of our facilities and we took care of our rolling stock, but also as importantly, or maybe more importantly, letting our community and letting our customers know what, we're, what we did. Um, the, other, uh, the other item that I wanted to mention was our focus on our, our workforce and keeping the, the, the safety of our workforce at top of mind. Um, our board, um, our stakeholders, our management team, we all focused on um, keeping our workforce safe, understanding that we had essential workers and those essential workers had to be able to provide uh, trips to other essential workers within our community to try to keep our city thriving. And we really did this through the approach that <laughs> supported our core values. And you can probably see them on the screen behind me, but our core values to be safe, be there, be open and be kind. And um, I could talk extensively on that, obviously I won't, but I did wanna just give you some examples. So for uh, being there, you know, we really uh, amped up our communications with our employees, sometimes daily communications through the pandemic to let them know how things were changing, what we as a management team were doing to protect their safety and our customers. Um, we um, looked at being open if there were suggestions for PPE or there were suggestions just of general uh, safety improvements we could make. We wanted to listen to our employees. Uh, being kind, we reflected that in the fact that um, there was a time when we had to reduce our service for a short time. And um, we made sure that our employees were still able to get 40 hours uh, minimum of work per week, knowing that we needed to retain those employees and have those employees in place when transit and ridership came back, which is what we're seeing today. And then finally, a focus on safety. And uh, this slide here really represents that focus on safety, probably images that you know, are very familiar to you, maybe some similar images you've seen within your community, but really uh, it's about, um, again, um, uh, making our rolling stock and our facilities as safe as possible, uh, doing some outreach. You can see some images here where we did mass giveaways um, to uh, customers. You can see an outreach event over uh, in the top uh, right of the slide where we, we uh, partnered with a YMCA to show the value and safety of transit, all of this during the pandemic. And then of course, an image there of some of the things we did um, internally, such as uh, employee uh, temperature checks before um, they came to work. So, um, so that's really um, uh, what we focused on were those basics. Um, and I think that's really what's helped us preserve our ridership. And I'm gonna show you some ridership numbers in a minute, but also help us gain our ridership back, uh, really in some cases at an increasing um, rate because we've just continued to to do what we did from the start and, and advise our community of that. Um, so as a result, um, we also conducted a uh, customer survey this year. You know, some may think during a pandemic maybe not the best time to conduct a customer survey, but we do that every year. We stuck to our plan. We did that this year. And our results showed that 79% of our riders felt safe riding the bus. 77% of our riders 
um, were satisfied with the COVID procedures that we had put in place and our overall satisfaction ratings were about 76%. And those numbers, aside from the new question we had about COVID, are very comparable to uh, previous years. And I, and I think you know that in itself is really um, kind of a testament to our team to be able to maintain those kind of numbers, especially in the areas of safety when we're operating transit in the environment that we had last year. So um, thinking of uh, ridership, and what is, you know, what has this led to in terms of ridership in Oklahoma City? I've got uh, four graphs I'll share with you. I won't go into all the details, but basically these are the different modes of transit that we have in Oklahoma City. Um, each graph, uh, the gray bars represent uh, the prior year, which would be during the onset of the pandemic compared to the current year. We'll start in the top left, and basically what uh, I wanted to show here is this is our fixed route bus ridership. You can see that um, since March, we've seen growth in ridership over the previous year. Um, at the end of June, uh, we finished with an average daily weekday passenger count of about 6,400 trips. Um, that's down from our pre-pandemic totals, of course, of, of roughly 10,000, but in about 11% increase from where we were last June. So overall, our fixed route ridership is about finishing up about 64, 65% of our pre-pandemic um, levels. Our mobility management over on the top right, now this isn't necessarily transit as defined by the FTA, but these are trans, this is transportation we provide within our community funded by area-wide aging agency grants. And um, typically these are trips we provide for two seniors for uh, 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 transportation to congregate meal sites, to uh, shopping trips, non-emergency medical. And you can see uh, in this particular um, area of our ridership, again, we've seen growth uh, this current year compared to uh, where we were a year ago during the pandemic. And part of that is because we've adapted our, our delivery model. So uh, although congregate meal sites continue to be shut down, uh, we are now delivering food boxes. We're now delivering frozen meals. Um, we're able to leverage some additional um, CARES funds that went to the area-wide aging agency to provide more non-emergency medical trips. Our demand for non-emergency medical increased as a result of some of the challenges um, with other transportation providers, but probably also because of some of our own capacity constraints on our fixed route bus. Um, on the bottom left is our Embark Plus or our paratransit ridership. Again, um, uh, you can see uh, growth year over year uh, in each of the months. Uh, in June, we finished at about 131 trips. That compares to about 207 on average pre-pandemic. Uh, it's about a 5% increase from where we were in June of last year. And then I'll, I'll finish by talking about Oklahoma City Streetcar. This is really where we've seen the, the, I guess, the greatest rebound, if you will, in ridership. It's certainly increasing and it's increasing at an increasing rate. Um, typically, um, the other thing I'll point out on this graph is you'll notice this is monthly ridership. So the others have been averaged daily. This is our monthly cumulative total. We have some pretty wild fluctuations, if you will, in weekday versus weekend. So we really look at our streetcar ridership kind of on a cumulative monthly basis. But really what should stand out here, here uh, for you is our June ridership on the Oklahoma City streetcar, uh, just over 26,000 trips. That compares to about 33,000 trips average pre-pandemic, but uh, significantly higher than where we were a year ago. In fact, it's about 163% increase um, in ridership um, compared to June of last year. And that's really just because we now have some events that are, that are occurring downtown. We have more people downtown working. So as we think about the theme of America opening back up and public transit uh, being open, um, you know, we're seeing that in our community, downtown events, those kinds of things are, are all opening back up and they're generating trips for us. So again, I touch briefly on, and I know you've heard this from others, touch briefly on, you know, really our, our approach has been pretty simple. Um, you know, we don't have a huge advertising budget. Um, we rely highly on social media. But we were committed as a management team to making our service as safe as it could be. But again, I just have to reiterate, letting people know what we were doing to make it safe. So you can see some social media posts here. Um, one um, is just about the general safety of the system. 
Uh, you can see here where we put our passengers or our customers on notice that we were expanding capacity. And I might mention we expanded that capacity with support of the uh, local health department uh, because they too evaluated our safety uh, measures and supported them. You can see uh, social media um, posts there on uh, promoting vaccinations. Of course, like others have mentioned, we provided free transit to vaccination sites. And then although we have continued to charge a fare the entire time, we have had specials, if you will. There's been some times where we've had free transit, say, uh, to support uh, the art, local arts festival. Um, you can see here an advertisement where we uh, had some half price transit pass sales. So we have been doing some promotions like that, but overall, um, you know, we're looking forward to um, a strong uh, summer and um, incrementally building our ridership back. So again, thank you for a lot, letting me tell you what's going on here in Oklahoma City. Thanks, Jason. Your systems highlighted something that above and beyond anything else is the North Star for everyone here at DOT from the administration and our career staff. Safety is absolutely our top concern. Alongside the responsibility we have to our fellow Americans, we know that the safer the system, the better the riders feel and the more likely they are to try transit. Now I'd like to introduce Robbie Mackinnon, CEO of the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority. Robbie, thank you for joining us today. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, I'll tell you what, it, uh, I don't have a pretty PowerPoint, so I'm just gonna talk for a second. Uh, at Ride KC, we're not uh, we're not in a position where we're rebuilding. We're reloading. Uh, the funding that the FTA has been able to to point in our direction and has allowed us to to move forward, while others are are back on their heels and trying to patch holes. We're moving forward on capital projects, on innovative projects. What COVID has allowed us to do is it's crystallized uh, it's crystallized the answer why or the, the question why it's crystallized the answer. And the answer is because it's about people, all right? The answer is, you know, we can talk about uh, uh, decimal points and, and, and dollar bills and, and all that all day long, but at the end of the day, you know, this is about people. It's allowed us to crystallize what we're actually doing, why we do what we do, and, and you know, why we get up in the morning and why should anybody care, right? It's crystallized our service around four pillars, access, access to housing, education, uh, job access, and healthcare. All that surrounded with the foundation of social equity, meaning zero fare. Now we don't say free fare because you know you say free fare and everybody wants to come out of the word work and say, no, it's cost somewhere. Of course it does. But my, my question to you then is, what do you want to invest in? Okay, we want to invest in people. COVID showed us nothing more th than the fact that we had, you know, you may not use public transit. And I hope our congressional uh, uh, folks actually understand the fact that you may not use public transit, but you darn well depend on a lot of people every day who do, okay? And it was us that kept this nation breathing. It was all of us that kept this nation breathing. And when you talk about 80% of your, your, your uh, uh, at least in our service level, 80% of our, our customers are, are people who really need us, okay? Uh, people of color, low income, whatever that may be. As far as I'm concerned, a fare is a regressive tax on them, okay? We need to break down these barriers and allow folks access. The gentleman from Washington said, I couldn't have said it better myself. It, this it, ridership is a byproduct. It's a byproduct of do you have access and options? All right. And that's what we build around here. The ridership comes. Our ridership never dipped below, uh, barely dipped below 60% during COVID and it has been back up at 80 or better now. Uh, uh, and, and there's two reasons for that. Number one, zero fare, but then number two, the, the two sides of the same coin are uh, thinking differently about our service, uh, reconstituting our grid with places that people need to go, okay? Buy hospitals, buy schools, buy grocery stores and all that. So that's been, that's been a critical path for us. And, and I guess my biggest point is, you know, what we all need to understand, I believe, is that you don't run, a, you can't run away from the people that need you the most. We're going to run towards them, right? And when you talk about zero fare, when we started, we we methodically moved uh, to zero fare for the last four and a half years. We we started making it free for veterans, working with the VA and local uh, veterans folks. Then we went to our superintendents for our school districts and said, "Hey, high school kids." Uh, and then we went to our safety net providers, domestic violence shelters, and all that. Got them all on board 
so that by the time even before COVID hit, we were we were at zero fare, uh, and which we thought was a critical path forward. Now, I understand that people say, well, you got to make up that revenue. How, how are you going to make up that revenue? Well, well, here's how we did it. Okay, we did it because normally I think transit agencies tend to want to sit out on an island and, and just think about everything between the curves and not outside the curve. What I'm saying is what we're doing at Ride KC is we're weaving ourselves into the community fabric. We're being a part of those four pillars, whether it's with our economic development agencies, whether it's with our hospitals or, or you know, Department of Labor and those kinds of things that allow us to, to, to do grants, get into different kinds of funding streams to diversify our funding streams rather than just looking at a light item from the state or from a local government or something like that. So a great example of that is Blue Cross and Blue Shield as our healthcare provider has come in and, and committed a million dollars a year for the first five years uh, of zero fare. So we really think it's made a difference. We really think redesigning our system to around the people that need us the most and, and, and making it zero fare has been a huge, had a huge impact and our elected officials understand that, okay? They understand that because, you know, a dollar fifty. Uh, you, the gentleman right before me talked about safety, you know, 85% or better of any issues that we had on a vehicle incidents or assaults were over a dollar fifty. We're over a fare box dispute. Okay. It cost us a, almost a million dollars to just to collect it. Okay. So when we took it away, our, our incident rates on our vehicles that have actually gone down another 39%, uh, with, even during COVID. So the, that's fantastic. So everybody that said, oh my gosh, you know, society's going to break down, cats living with dogs, mass hysteria, if you go zero fare, it's been absolutely right. just the opposite. Our rates, uh, uh, survey results have been even higher uh, since we did that, even though, e even during COVID. So we're, we're very proud of that. And, and we're very proud of the fact that what we're doing here is changing the culture, right? Changing the culture of our employees to, to go, you know what, if you want to come here, and just make a paycheck, there's probably in the place for you, all right? But if you wanna come here and make a difference in a paycheck, come on down. That's who we want here, right? Our folks go out every day and do amazing things in the community that are way above and beyond their job description. And that's, what's, that's what sets them apart. And that's what gets our customers uh, back also. So I'm very proud of that. Um, look, all, all, all I'll say is, is uh, the return on investment, for compassion, for empathy, for social equity, far outweighs the return on investment for, for concrete and asphalt, all right? What do you wanna invest in, all right? These transit investments, this, this stuff that's going through Congress right now, transit infrastructure, it's, it's not just an investment in transit, it's an investment in people. And it's an investment in the people who need us the most. I'll leave it at that if that's okay. Absolutely, Robbie, thank you so much. And uh, great work. And I know KCATA's focus on equity has really fostered a lot of customer loyalty across the, the Kansas City area. I'm really hoping to get out to KC soon myself and it's partly to ride the system, but it's also mostly for burnt ends. I wanna introduce now our final guest speaker. As you all know, the Biden-Harris administration is committed to equity and racial justice. It's incredibly important in transportation as you just heard, because we all know of examples in our history when our country, through the transportation system has left people behind, whether through benign neglect or systemic ignorance. Transit has to be a part of the struggle we all face to ensure equity in our communities. And that also includes accessibility. Again, not just as a social good, but as an economic imperative. Without every American participating, our country is in a global contest at less than our full strength. And to better understand how we can make sure that all Americans, no matter their abilities, are able to use transit to increase our economic power and production, I'd like to welcome Carol Tyson, currently serving as Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities Vice Chair and Transportation Task Force Co-Chair. Carol, welcome. Thanks, Paul, for the opportunity to present today. And thank you to the FTA Administrator Fernandez and staff for convening this conversation. I'll begin by providing a visual description of myself. I am a white androgynous looking person with short hair. Today, I am wearing a blue jacket and black rimmed glasses. There's a white wall and the corner of a painting behind me. I'll be referring to slides, uh, but they have text only. Thanks, next slide, please. 
CCD is a coalition advocating for federal public policy that ensures the self-determination, independence, empowerment, and integration of people with disabilities in all aspects of society. Our Transportation Task Force supports President Biden's goals of prioritizing equity and increasing access to public transportation to meet the needs of all residents. As you are aware, lack of accessible, affordable mobility options continues to be a significant barrier to services, employment, and the ability to benefit from and contribute to our communities. Next slide. We are very appreciative of the transit agencies that provided additional services to people with disabilities during the worst of the pandemic through incidental use policies. As has been mentioned, transit and paratransit was used to deliver meals and provide access to grocery stores and pharmacies, served as Wi-Fi hotspots for communities and students, and transported essential workers to and from their jobs. We are grateful to agencies and stakeholders that listened to our concerns regarding rear door boarding policies that ensured access for riders that required a ramp through the front door, and for listening to our recommendations regarding mask policies that accommodated all riders. We also called for continued provision of service for everyone, especially the most underserved. Accessibility, safety, service provision, and civil rights obligations must not be set aside during a crisis or ever. Next slide. This week marked the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Over the past three decades, we've seen progress toward a more accessible public transportation system. The nation's fleet of fixed route buses is accessible, paratransit ensures service provision, and the majority, but not all, rail transit stations are accessible. We're calling for improvements that will ensure access and increase ridership including full accessibility of legacy rail systems, bus stops, sidewalks, and pedestrian signals, and accessibility and equity requirements in partnerships with shared mobility companies. We also encourage inclusion and leadership of people with disabilities in all marginalized communities in transportation planning, especially emergency planning. Next slide. We will continue to advocate for accessibility in the US transit system because we know it is a lifeline for many people with disabilities and for the personal care attendants, direct care and healthcare workers that our community relies on every day. We support public transportation, which is essential to the disability community and everyone across the country who rides. And we applaud the FTA's transit renewal initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, and your message is well received and it's very important for all of us to hear. We've heard today how communications is vitally important to renew transit ridership, and I'd like to see if we can dig a little bit deeper. I hope our panelists will indulge us with a few questions to see what more we can learn. We're a little heavy on time, so if you can keep your responses to two or three minutes, that would be great. Let's start out with Paul Scotellis, and we'd like to talk a little bit about analytics. Who has run analytics or conducted surveys to find out how ridership is changing, and what about the ridership dashboard across the country to see how ridership is changing. How has that really changed what you've done at APTA? Thank you, Paul, uh, very much. Appreciate that. First of all, it's been enlightening to listen to our colleagues here and have them share their personal experiences. First, let me just say that over the past couple of months, we really have um, really convened what I call a series of uh, sessions, uh, listening, sharing sessions, mostly with our CEOs uh, representing agencies all around the country. And we've done this in small groups, agencies large and small. The intent here was to have our agency CEOs exchange information with what are their most pressing issues, and importantly, what are they doing about it? How are they approaching these issues of winning back riders and, and so forth? Uh, and as we expected, our agencies are in very frequent communication with their ridership groups uh, and stakeholders to obtain insights and input on all the ridership issues that impact uh, their system. They do this through formal surveys, community listening sessions, and through social media channels. And they're using these results uh, to really rethink, and as you've heard, redesign their entire route structures, uh, both to meet the changing demand for service and also to address equity issues, which really have been laid bare by the temp and, uh, pandemic. They're asking questions, they're listening, they're letting riders know that transit will be ready when they return uh, and that they'll be ramping up service to meet their needs. In terms of the APTA dashboard, again, I, I think this is a great tool for our membership uh, to help them in making some critical decisions. You know, every transit CEO uh, in this pandemic era with all the uncertainty that's around us 
is not only looking at their system and seeing what's happening, but they're asking, I wonder what my colleague in Boston is doing or in Kansas City or in Seattle, you name the city. And so the ridership tool that we have developed allows them to get a quick grasp, what's happening with ridership elsewhere? Who do I wanna compare myself to that are we consider peers? And then what are they doing importantly that perhaps I might borrow from? You know, as an industry, we're extraordinarily good at sharing information and learning, much like we're doing here today. This is where both FTA and APTA can play a critically important role, uh, given the wide view that we have of the national transit uh, landscape, to borrow those that are doing some great things, whether it's a big agency or a smaller agency, and see if that has applicability to what we might be doing in our own community. So it's vitally important that our industry continue to watch carefully about what ridership is happening. Uh, is it moving? In what direction is it moving? What can we be doing to address the, the needs of our riders? And then looking to respond as quickly as possible to show them that we care about them and that we care about bringing them back to our systems. So that's, I think, uh, what, what I would say relative to, to what we've extracted here over the last couple of months that I think is extraordinarily valuable. Thanks a lot, Paul. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to send our next question to both Scott Bogren from CTAA and Roger Mlar from Ashto. Uh, both of you described a lot of stories earlier and, and showed how agencies are getting people on transit. I wonder if you could pick out the one very best example of a ridership promotional example out there and why it's working. And Scott, we'll start with you. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Paul. One of the things that I think uh, uh, in talking to our members, I'm gonna highlight uh, our member up in Flint, Michigan and Ed Benning and his system at the Flint MTA. Uh, uh, Flint has launched a Rides to Wellness program. They had they kind of leaned into the on-demand role and kind of felt like, why should we let anybody else come into our community and provide on-demand service when we're the ones that are really good at this? They leaned into it, and you know, throughout the pandemic, they saw that the ridership there so strong. He's anticipating between twenty and twenty-five thousand riders a month coming up, which is an amazing uh, transformation of a service that tr has a very mass transit district, very traditional. The other one I wanted to talk about, I remember out in Leveland, Texas, just outside of Lubbock, you know, when we're talking about value over volume, what speaks more to value than a system that its brand new facilities first, first act is to be the first vaccine clinic in a 17 county area and a thousand people in a day get vaccinated. And that role for transit to play, that has to, in the end, translate to ridership because like Robbie was saying earlier, it's an emphasis on people. And so that's, that's really the key we've been seeing. Thanks, Scott. Roger? Oh, well, thanks, a great question. Here in Washington State with the DOT, we're uh, working on a summertime program to market our Travel Washington system which is a rural inner city bus service that can link you to any community in Washington state. We've developed branded service for all four lines across the state. We've updated their websites with a more consistent look and feel. We've created Facebook pages and media outreach tools for them. We're about to roll out a special offer for reduced fares on our routes. We've had the system for years. Now we're promoting it. <clears throat> Just as important to serve as the services themselves is the ability of all of our systems to get the word out about the services to the communities they serve. Uh, each of the transit agencies in Washington has done a remarkable job and uh, providing service, and they're doing a better and better job in marketing and promoting new services. We've got examples all over the country. Our, our colleagues in Mississippi, some of the agencies are actually going one-on-one -on -one home visits with existing customers and reaching out with phone calls and emails to see what they can do to provide even better service. Um, there's a lot of uh, increased use of marketing and advertising with an emphasis on safety messages. And transit agencies are also all over social media now, Facebook and other outlets to help with that. We could really use FTA's expertise and assistance to do more with marketing and outreach to get the message out that we're open for business through PSAs and flyers and advertising, social media and the right. And it would also be greatly a, of help if states and the subrecipients could get assistance from health and human services agencies to educate and increase public awareness of the safety of transit. You know, while the marketing and promotions is certainly making people aware, uh, we need to make sure that there are two important ways to increase ridership in the near term. 
One is to get unvaccinated people who do not have access to cars to vaccination sites using transit. Um, many of our agencies in Washington state are offering free rides to vaccination sites, and I know others all around the country, but more and more of that partnership with health agencies and human services agencies would be great. And then, you know, finally, when it's safe to do so and balance with telework and other TDM strategies, we're looking to re returning to that full in-person capacity at centers of employment and entertainment and other commercial activity around Washington state. Thank you so much, Roger. We really appreciate it. And uh, this question to Carol Tyson. Carol, have we seen ridership uh, increase? What are the, the major steps that we can take to make sure that as ridership lifts up, everyone is lifted up with it and everyone has an equal opportunity to get where they need to go? Thank you for the question. Uh, I'm going to reiterate what we've heard and really commend uh, my fellow panelists on their commitment. To ensure equity for disabled riders, agencies should, at a minimum, invest in accessible bus stops and transit stations, sidewalks, curb ramps, and audible pedestrian signals while prioritizing underserved areas. If we can't get to transit, we're unlikely to use it. Any partnerships with shared mobility or AV services must require accessibility for all riders and should complement rather than supplant any fixed route transit service, which is tied to paratransit service areas. As has been mentioned, increasing service hours and frequency accommodates riders working early morning, late night, or overnight shifts, and ensuring PPE for workers and hygiene measures for vehicles increases safety for all riders. I urge continuing discount or zero fare programs and reviewing environmental justice and enforcement policies that may disproportionately impact already marginalized riders, including decriminalizing fare evasion. And I strongly encourage adopting equity performance measures, utilize, utilizing tools like CNT's All Transit and Transit Center's Equity Dashboard, and hiring staff dedicated to ensuring equity. Agencies can build trust and reach out to local communities, prioritizing engagement with riders with disabilities, Black, Indigenous, people of color, low-income riders, and older adults. Agencies should ask how their, their access to transit was impacted due to the pandemic any protest responses in cities, including curfews and other states of emergency. And agencies could follow the lead of these riders. They should follow the lead of these riders to update emergency plans. Finally, I encourage everyone to join the remaining listening sessions to learn from other equity advocates. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I wanna to talk to our transit agency GMs now. And uh, the, the question, it's kind of a lightning round if you could each take about two minutes and, and this is for us, honestly. How can FTA best support transit agencies in increasing ridership um, as the pandemic hits the Delta variant, but then also as it recedes, uh, hopefully in, in the coming months? And let's start, go west to east. So we'll start out with Sharon Cooney from San Diego. Sharon? Sure, thanks. I think the best thing that the FTA can do for us is to continue being a cheerleader on the national stage, uh, really, focusing messages around how transit supports the community, um, how it's gonna support the community as we get out of the pandemic, but then also what it's doing for the environment and climate change. Um, I think that's really the best um, help at this point, but also being a clearinghouse for best practices as we move forward. It's amazing how dynamically things have changed in the last 18 months for transit agencies as a whole. And I think we have had, you know, daily, hourly um, changes that we've had to incorporate into all, the way we deliver our service uh, because of the pandemic. And I think that change is always going to continue. Uh, what it does is it's allowed us to innovate. And so I think the FDA can really help us all understand how other agencies are adapting as we move into these crazy um, times of change. And then finally, um, you know, I have to thank Ray Tellis uh, throughout the pandemic. He's been really supportive of the transit agencies in his region um, through things like getting us PPE right off the bat and, you know, a, a lot of the other steps he's taken to make sure that we understand what's happening and how we can keep our employees and the public safe. And so those are all great things that I think that um, under administrator um, Fernandez will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon and Robbie Mackinnon of Kansas City. How are, what are your thoughts on what FTA can help with? My thoughts are uh, they're doing it. You're doing it. 
uh, our Region 7 Administrator, Mokti Ahmad, his staff, uh, the ability to answer a phone call uh, quickly, the, the, their ability to be supportive, their ability to, to give us resources, and, and has been absolutely fantastic, especially over the last year. And to Administrator Fernandez, you know, I, I barely, I bet you she barely got her boxes unpacked and she'd already talked to me four times. Uh, uh, so I really, really appreciate that. I really appreciate that responsiveness and that, that ability to help. The only thing I would add then is that if we could start having conversations about how from a federal government department letter uh, level, we could start breaking down those silos. Uh, public transit is that one thing. It's that one thing that connects everything, right? It's the glue. So having, having public transit be able to talk to HUD, to be able to talk to the Department of Labor, to be able to have those kind of conversations so we can weave ourselves into that, I think would bear uh, big dividends later uh, when, it, when it comes to transit investment itself. Thank you. And finally, and, and Jimmy Morales from Miami. Paul, uh, like my fellow GMs, I mean, I have nothing but praise for FTA's role uh, in the recent months and, and before. Director Taylor and her staff have been extremely supportive uh, and we appreciate everything they've done. That said, you know, I think one of the, I think all transit folks learned is not to let a good crisis go to waste. And I think all of us across this country you've heard today engaged in creativity and flexibility and how to uh, adapt to these issues to try to bring these agencies through it and some with great success. I would hope that as we emerge from this, not only the FDA, but also state DOTs, keep some of that in mind. Keep in mind how flexibility and more nimble procurement uh, may be helpful, uh, both on the federal and state levels to get some of these things done. Uh, greater uh, uh, focus perhaps on partnerships with the private sector. You know, from the first and last mile to the only mile, private sector solutions are, like micromobility can play a big role and have obviously during the pandemic. So I think keeping that, that creativity, flexibility, thinking outside the box, I think will enable us uh, to, to grow and not just survive the pandemic, to really grow and be that glue uh, that Robbie just talked about. Thank you so much, Jimmy. We really appreciate it. And uh, one, our last uh, last speaker, Jason Fairbrush from Oklahoma City, one minute for you. Yeah, thank you. Real quick, um, again, um, I have to acknowledge everything the FTA has done already to get us to this point, um, the flexibility that they've um, helped us with, with, with CARES funding, et, et cetera. Um, just real practically speaking, uh, to get the ridership back, at least in our community, we've got to maintain the confidence of our, of, of our community, and we've got to keep our people. And so, again, just real practically speaking, maybe some flexibility with uh, formula funds, um, to be able to uh, uh, do some of these advertising campaigns and, and, and let our communities know what we're doing in transit. And then also, uh, we can't miss an opportunity to show appreciation to our employees, employees that have been working in an environment that really, realistically, they never signed up for. So just for some flexibility on, you know, some, uh, some opportunities to spend some funds, funds on employee appreciation and recognition, understanding how difficult it is to find, um, um, you know, workers in this environment that we're in. So a um, couple of practical suggestions there, just some more flexibility. Thank you. And thank you everyone who's on our panels today for all of your participation and your thoughts. I hope you'll all continue to join us in our national conversation. We're calling it America's Open and Transit's Open. We have two more planned listening sessions on Friday, August the 6th. We'll join guest panelists to focus on how improvements in safety can build public confidence in transit. And on Friday, August 13th, we'll explore ways to increase ridership with a focus on building community partnerships. Finally, we're gonna wrap up and summarize everything we've learned in a Transit Renewal Initiative Summit, and that's scheduled for later in August. Be sure to tune into our website for the exact time and date. You can register for both those listening sessions on the website as well. That website is available in the chat here on Zoom. Now, to wrap up today's listening session, I'll turn it over to two more top-notch members of FTA's regional leadership team. Makti Ahmad from Region 7 and Acting Administrator from Region 6, Don Kosky. Makti? Thanks, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for your participation and attendance uh, in this event. Yes, America's open and transit's open. My name is Makti Ahmad, Regional Administrator for FTA's Region 7. Our office is located in Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City is also the home of the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority, also known as KCATA. They are led by my good friend, the fabulous Mr. Robbie Mekinen and his team. It has been exciting and a pleasure to have been working with them. 
Rob is always coming up with fresh ideas, as you heard earlier, to improve transit in KC. Their team is strategic, focused on safety, and always checking the pulse of the riders. It is important for all of us to continue to keep our eyes and ears open to learn what is working between your services and your customers. Thanks to your dedication and determination to keep transit operating during the last year and a half, transit ridership is coming back from that steep downward trend experienced during the peak of the pandemic caused by COVID-19. There were many good practices that were discussed today and presented today to engage customers to continue riding public transportation, attracting new customers and winning back the lost customers from last year. So please continue promoting and implementing ideas to win back public transportation riders. Working together and sharing what is working we can lay the foundation to build back better that ridership. And I am looking forward to riding that bus, ferry boat, and rail after the pandemic is over, which we hope will be soon. Thank you again, everybody, for your participation and attendance today. America's open, transit's open, ridership will return to new highs after the pandemic because there is a considerable amount of pent up demand to ride public transit. Thank you. Thank you, Makti. Hi, everyone. I'm Don Kosky, joining you from Fort Worth, Texas. I am encouraged by what I've heard, and I continue to be amazed at the knowledge and creativity that our transit partners bring to the table every day. In my role as the last speaker, I would like to thank everyone who presented today and who participated in the Q&A. And also, I wanted to send appreciation on behalf of FTA Administrator Fernandez to everyone who took time out of their busy schedules to tune in and to listen. FTA is committed to helping renew ridership, and we know that all of you are too. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Mokti. And thanks again to everybody who participated and who listened in on our session today. Before we close, I wanna draw your attention to a list of all the organizations we've heard from today. You may wanna take a screenshot of this image for future reference. We'll plan to post this presentation and the recording on our website. So you can check the chat feature here in Zoom where the website transit.dot.gov slash transit is open is available. We also look forward to hearing you and your thoughts on how we can get people on transit across America. You can email us at transitsopen at dot.gov. Again, that email address is transitsopen at dot.gov. I also encourage you to follow FTA's social media accounts where we'll be highlighting many of the best practices and transit agencies that we you've heard from today. Thank you, and again from Washington, I'm Paul Kincaid here at FTA.